This is a podcast of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. To learn more about how you can support Scripps, visit us online at scripps.ucsd.edu. This coming March marks the 50th anniversary of the Keeling Curve, a depiction of rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere that has become an iconic image of science. Just as much as models of the double helix structure of DNA or Darwin's Finch sketches, the curve has come to represent a moment when our understanding of nature changed profoundly. Its namesake is the late Charles David Keeling, who began a record atop Hawaii's Mauna Loa that went on to serve as an early warning that humans are capable of changing nature on a global scale. Keeling inspired a legion of younger scientists, like Scripps's Andrew Dixon, to make similar measurements in the ocean to help answer more and more complicated questions about climate change. Another inspired scientist was Keeling's own son, Ralph, who recalls the day some 30 years ago when his father mused aloud at the kitchen table. The father speculated about how scientists could better understand the role of land plants in the carbon cycle. If that could be understood, it would help explain where all the CO2 produced by human activity was ending up. He dropped the hint that measuring oxygen in the atmosphere might be a way to get a handle on that. This wasn't by way of encouraging me to get into the field or even do this particular piece of work, but it, I was absorbing ideas from different directions and that stuck in my mind. And many years later, when I was in graduate school, I realized that I might have an idea of how to actually measure these changes in oxygen and, and, and viewed it as something that would be fun to work on. The program we're now involved with at making uh, CO2 measurements in the oceans and most importantly, perhaps, reference materials for oceanic CO2 measurements first started in discussions I had with uh, Charles David Keeling in the 1980s where he pointed out that there was a real need for standards for CO2 measurement so that it would be practical to mount a global study of the ocean without relying purely on the measurements of one single laboratory. The younger Keeling and Dixon are now at Scripps making ultra-precise measurements of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and other gases in the air and sea. Ralph Keeling's work, supported by that of Dixon and many others, has led to sobering conclusions about nature's ability to compensate for fossil fuel burning. But the researchers say their work at least makes it clear what options society has. The earliest question was really, it was apparent looking at the atmospheric record from Mauna Loa that not all the CO2 that was known to be put into the atmosphere was staying in the atmosphere. It was obviously going somewhere else, and we had no idea how much was going into the oceans or how much was going into land plants. This ultimately becomes important to understand not only how much is going into these two additional sinks, but why it goes there, and how that might change as climate changes, or as land use changes, or as ocean mixing changes in order to be able to predict likely futures for our life here on this planet. Well, we expected and found that oxygen levels are decreasing with time. They follow a pattern very much like the Mauna Loa record, except in reverse. That is, we see an oscillation that reflects the seasonal growth and uh, decay of the biosphere, that trees are growing in the summer, and uh, you see a return flux of carbon in the fall and winter when there's a decay of the leaf litter. A similar cycle affects oxygen coming from the oceans. So we see this cyclical behavior, but superimposed on that we see a year-to-year -year decrease. And that decrease is very nearly explained by the amount of fuel humans are burning every year, the amount of fossil fuel humans are burning. The work of Ralph has shown that the plants themselves are actually growing a little more and taking up more CO2, but the lion's share is now starting to accumulate in the atmosphere. And the increases in the atmosphere are speeding up. The extent of increase is speeding up with time, suggesting that these two major sinks, land plants and the ocean, really are not capable of keeping up or mitigating the human effect on the atmosphere. I think the bottom line is that we're not gonna get a control on this unless we curtail fossil fuel burning. That's the real bottom line. I mean, we could grow trees to help a little bit, but it's not going to stop the trend, and it's not really going to reverse it, and it's not going to compensate for the huge amount of fossil fuel that we potentially could go through. We'll see ecosystems all over the planet on the run, 
an ecosystem on the run isn't like an ecosystem that's been in place for a while, so there'll be disruptions of all sorts. There'll be human migration, because people will not be able to live off the land in the way they did before, mostly touching on the developing world, I think, but uh, it'll affect all countries. Um, my personal fear is that the pressure to migrate will trigger conflict. In a sense, the most immediate threat to any person is another person. But this will cross into that arena, I'm afraid, if, particularly if we allow it to progress at a rapid pace. This is Wendy Hunter-Barker for Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego.